Thanks very much for the opportunity to speak. I'm going to tell you about two things in this presentation. By the end of this 10 minutes, I would like you to, one, use more hive plots, and two, do more open science. So consider for a moment a scatter plot. The nice thing about a scatter plot is that every point of data can be laid out visually based on the content of the data. So the reason that a given point is where it is is because the contents of that point are uh, an x value and a y value. So we have the nice property that it's easy for us to lay down points, and there's a nice reference system for us to use. And that common reference system is really useful because that lets us do things like compare scatter plots to each other so that we can do some analyses across different data sets. However, increasingly, data sets that we're working with in biology look more like this, hairballs. Uh, this is an, an uh, example of a protein-to-protein -protein interaction network, and they don't have that same property of a point being at the position that it is based on its contents, variously because the way that we visualize them are through different kinds of layout algorithms like force-weighted algorithms which put things based on the position of the network. And that's a problem because that means that depending on what algorithm you use to lay out the network, even the same network laid out with four different algorithms might look very different from each other, leaving you with the inability to compare them across you know, other networks that actually have different content. Uh, we have this problem in connectomics. So here's an example of the C. elegans connectome with motor neurons, inner neurons, and sensory neurons laid out. Uh, this was one choice that uh, this author uh, used to, to lay out the, the different connections between the neurons that are there. Um, but a different paper might use a different uh, way to show it with uh, sensory neurons at the top uh, on a line, uh, motor neurons in the bottom on a line, and the inner neurons in using some sort of clustering thing. And of course, every way you lay it out is trying to show some different story, but it'd be nice if there was some way to have a standardized means so you could compare these across each other. So, Krzywinski in 2011 wrote a really important paper proposing hive plots, and this is how they work. Uh, a hive plot is a oops. So a hive plot. Let's see, it's this thing. Give me, yeah. Okay. So a hive plot. Um, imagine you have a network with three layers. Okay, NSRR on the first layer, IHFA on the second, MICF and NR. FD uh, on the bottom. Now you want to do something equivalent to the scatter plot, so you want to be able to put it on an axis. And for a network, a sensible thing to use for a metric is the degree of a node. So uh, you'd put, so let's take three different axes for the three different layers. Okay, so take this and rotate it. And uh, for the first one, we'll put NSRR here at three, because it's got three edges coming out, the degree being uh, the number of edges going in or out of a node. Um, IHFA we put up here at six. Uh, because it's got a bunch more, right? Six uh, edges, and MICF down here because it's only got one. Okay, so we got these three edges. So that's the first trick of high plots: is you uh, graph based on uh, the degree, and then you connect them in the same way that the edges are are located up here. And the second trick is to be able to show you something about uh, like engage your spatial reasoning ability. And so then we take those three axes and we put them on a radial basis, like this. So x1 goes over here x2 over here, x3 over here, and you can connect them together with edges. Now, the choices that you make of what to put on x1, x2, or x3 are kind of up to you, but there are some really useful conventions that we'll talk about. Okay? So that's the idea of high plots. You can find out more about highplot.com. This is not my invention. It's not my website. Uh, I don't get any commission, but it's really good stuff. You should check it out. Okay. So uh, to review then, you could take a network that looks like this, A, B, C, D, E, F, works with undirected networks, works with directed networks, and you get a high plot like this. If we choose to put A and B on this axis, C and D on this axis, E and F on this axis, then we can connect them together like this. Now you'll notice that you don't render, by doing this, you don't render the connections between like E and F, or A and B or C and D, right, because they're on the same axis. You can choose to do that with one more extension of a high plot, which is that you can clone an axis, right, so we take this middle axis, we split it, so we put exactly the same nodes in exactly the same positions, but now we can also render the connections between them, okay? This is, uh, you'll see why this is important in a moment. So the question that we asked uh, with the Open Worm Project is, can we apply this to the C. elegans connectome? Okay? Let me tell you a little bit about the Open Worm Project really quick. It's an international open science community. Um, it has nine core members and 23 contributors. It's, a lot of it's on GitHub with 24 different repositories and seven, 70 GitHub followers, um, and 88 folks on the high traffic mailing list, which means that they're subjected to all the content that goes through the project. It doesn't have a headquarters. It's, the open science community, it's online. Um, and this is inspired by uh, books like this, Reinventing Discovery by Michael Nielsen. I highly recommend you read it. Um, the goal of the project is to create a full-scale simulation of the C. elegans in the long term. In the medium term, uh, working with a specific behavioral data set and trying to predict it uh, using a 3D neuromechanical model. You can find out more about that at openworm.org. 
Um, but so, and this Connectome, I wanted to say a little bit about it. Um, it's kind of a, 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 you probably heard about it. Uh, it was originally published in 1986 by this guy, John White. Um, after 13 years of work pouring through electron micrographs, uh, counting synapses under the electron microscope. And uh, the paper was a tour de force. It was this 400 and some page article uh, that showed and proved that all the synapses were where they were supposed to be. And it also had the effect of consolidating its naming scheme so that all 302 neurons had a name of four or five letters. And, uh, and coolly, in, in 2013, he reached out to the Open Worm Project, John White, uh, and he did an online hangout uh, talking about the paper uh, and going through all those details, which you can get on openworm.org. That's actually a live link to this. By the way, this entire presentation is online right now. If you go to Twitter, I just tweeted it about 45 minutes ago, so you can click on the links that are here. All right. Um, and uh, so what the Open Worm Project has done it, to kind of update this is it's converted, the, um, it's converted the connectome into an anatomical framework with all of the, the neurons represented in NeuroML, and it uses the connection statements inside NeuroML to embed the contents um, of that connectome in a spatial framework. And if you go to the open source brain site, uh, you can actually see this for yourself where you can click on a neuron and it'll change the colors of its neighbors based on whether a neighboring neuron is an ingoing neuron or an outgoing neuron. It's actually quite a nice little feature. So that's kind of the C. elegans connectome brought into sort of modern frameworks and sort of stuff that you can do online. And again, live links are on the slides. Okay, so, um, so I'll get to the results of this process in a moment of, of what we did, but first I want to say a little bit more about the process. So in order to make this work, we started by posting the description of what we wanted to do, apply high plots to C. elegans connectome as a GitHub issue, okay? And here's the GitHub issue itself, link at the bottom, all right? And we explain kind of how to do it. And uh, on the mailing list, um, we got a uh, introduction by a gentleman named Pedro Tabakov, who's the first author on this, uh, on this um, presentation, who said, I'd like, to, I'd like to volunteer, what can I do? We pointed him at the issue. Here's Pedro on GitHub, here's his GitHub account. Okay, he's actually from Brazil. Uh, I actually have not ever met him in person. Um, and that's kind of how open science works. But three weeks later, he looked at that issue, he worked on it, and he committed a folder of goodies uh, implementing high plots. So let's see what he created. Uh, before we do that, though, I should point out uh, that there have been other explorations of the C. elegans connectome structurally. Here are two articles that have looked at fractal properties and have looked at topological clustering of the C. elegans connectome. Um, none of them have ever used high plots. The best of our knowledge, uh, this has never been done before. So, um, what we, um, uh, okay, so here's an example of a high plot using the C. elegans connectome. On this axis, only sensory neurons. On this axis, only, on these two axes, remember the split I showed you, only inner neurons, and on this axis, only motor neurons. And you can already start to see some things that are, are kind of interesting about this. We'll drill into one thing in a moment. Um, but this is a rendering of just the chemical synapses, okay? Because the connectome had both chemical synapses and gap junctions, all right? This is what it looks like, just gap junctions. And you can already start to see, just with those two pictures, I'll go back and forward, those are those two pictures, you can already see that we're laying out the network in exactly the same way, but we're seeing different features. They're actually very different networks with very different edges. But you can already start to see that, for example, there's an asymmetry here um, and many other things. What we, what we focused in on was the fact that these uh, neurons up here, the nodes that are up here stand like heads and shoulders above the ones uh, below, something that hadn't really ever been pointed out. And uh, we wanted to drill in and see if that was actually true, if it went beyond just the visualization. So uh, we switched tools, we went away from the high plot, we plotted the histogram of the degree of every uh, node of every interneuron. And sure enough, uh, the ones at the top are looking actually pretty high in degree. So we zoomed in on those, looked a little bit closer, and yeah, sure enough, the interneurons that are there are way statistically significant above average degree in all the neurons um, of the connectome. And so this is an interesting feature. Um, interestingly, um, so this is something that's been observed in a different kind of connectome. Um, Vandal, Hubel, and Sporns uh, talked about a rich club connectome, and this in the, is sort of the human connectome, or um, in looking at large-scale um, uh, large projections. And they propose this concept of a rich club, which, which refers to a, a network, a master network of nodes that, um, that uh, sort of are sort of driving this. And we'd love to compare that to, uh, to this, but uh, they, haven't, uh, they haven't used any high plots yet, so we'd really love to see the high plot version of that. Um, I should also say that there's a lot more interesting stuff I don't have time to go into in the 10 minutes allotted to me, but there's also a lot of other interesting patterns when you start uh, playing with these high plot things. Uh, this one is looking at edges that are above uh, a weight of five. Okay, so you can explore more for yourself online. You can click a bunch of links and, and check this stuff out. 
So I'd just like to acknowledge uh, Timothy Buzzbice was responsible for producing the Connectome data set that was used. Um, and Pedro Tabakov, of course, did the work that, uh, as I mentioned. So really quickly, um, so I, I think the things I want you to get, take away from this is complex networks currently, hard to draw insight from and compare. Uh, if you use high plots, you can actually do a lot more interesting comparisons. And an open science approach um, to high plots, uh, an open science approach to doing this can establish the connection between high plots and the C. elegans connectome. An analysis of the C. elegans connectome shows a striking bridge club phenomenon. But again, as I said at the beginning, the two things I really want you to take away are, one, use more high plots, and two, do more open science. Thank you. Thanks, we have time for one quick question for Stephen. What, what, if, uh, what, what can you do if there isn't a way to, um, if there isn't any sort of clear labels on the things? Because it requires that you divide them up by labels, right? Uh, what do you mean? Labels you, 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 have access, you have to get, the nodes have to get to an axis. So if there's no, do you have to maybe start with a clustering or something? If you don't know what, you always had motor neurons versus motor oh. neurons or... Uh, yeah, I mean, so motor neurons and neurons, sensory neurons is just a property of those nodes. Um, you, if, right, if you have nothing at all, if you have nothing at all, you can use the structure of the network itself, right? So you could put on one node, only uh, on one axis, only nodes that have uh, outgoing connections, but no incoming connections. A, s a second axis, the ones that have both incoming and outgoing, and uh, the third, only the ones that have incoming. And that would be a standard way that you could do it uh, on a directed uh, network. Cool. Did, did you did you notice that the inner neurons had that, that there were more that the that the nodes at the top the feature that I pointed out was that they stood a lot above the others? Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> like, okay let's talk about it offline. <laughs> okay. Let's thank you, Stephen, again. Okay. The next speaker is Giorgio Innocenti um, from the Karolinska, and uh, yeah. So well, thank you for. This functioning? Yeah, um, yeah, thank you for asking, for allowing me to talk here. Um, in 1971, uh, a person who became then my colleague here at Karolinska, Christa Christensen, published a paper which was, one, in my opinion, one of the most important papers in the history of neuroanatomy, showing that neuron will pick up horse radish peroxidase, will transport it along the axon back to the cell body. This allowed to trace connections in the brain in a way which was only dreamt of before. Then later on it was found that uh, neurons actually like to pick up and transport all kinds of junk. And so all kinds of uh, interesting uh, uh, you know, networks were discovered and presented in, in the literature. One of these is the very famous uh, visual system uh, network by Fellerman and Van Essen. And then, um, of course, more recently, in vivo, track tracing allowed to also see connectivity in the human brain with non-invasive techniques. What is nice and what is missing, these studies gave, gave a, a very complete you know, image of the connectivity in the brain of all kinds of species, but one element was missing, and that was element was time. And I came to this issue of time a little bit by an accident, looking at the axons going into the corpus callosum from the monkey brain, comparing these were animals which had been injected with the biotinylated dextrin in different areas. And then when I go into the corpus callosum and I look at the axon uh, diameters, you see very clearly that axons coming from prefrontal cortex are thin. These are longitudinally and transversally cut and axons coming from motor cortex are thick. And then you can trace these axons. And this is what the basis of the stuff that I will be talking about, is just these. Axons which have been labeled with biotinylated dextrin transported and then measured in the optical microscope using high resolution uh, uh, lenses. Just I, I have the time to give you 
just the flavor, or perhaps the stink, of this story, which is the following. What you see here is the corpus callosum, and then you see a bunch of structures which are projecting into the corpus callosum. This image is in the abstract that I have presented. You see RS17 and 18, mid-temporal, V4, etc. And then you see a certain number of subcortical structures, like the thalamus here, the nucleus caudatus, and the internal capsule. And what each of these arrows shows, the thickness of the arrow is proportional to the median axon diameter going to that structure, from, for example, from RA9 to the internal capsule. And then the length is proportional to the length, not in this case, but in the other cases, the length is proportional to the connection between the area of origin and the site of termination, the corpus callosum in this case. And then the numbers that you see here are the delays which are generated by the thickness of the axon, where the thickness of the axon is proportional to the conduction velocity of the axon, and then the length of the pathway. So these are the delays which are generated by the combination of the length of the pathway and the thickness of the axon. And when you look at this, you see that practically each area is generating different delays to the target structures, which range between, for the corpus callosum, between 2.4 milliseconds to something like, you know, 5.9 milliseconds, and this is just half of the conduction time to the contralateral hemisphere. So it seems that if we are using this kind of approach, we are going to introduce time into the connectivity graphs, and the first uh, information which comes to us when we look at something like this is that there are families of structures which are faster in conducting to their targets than others. And this really outlines the fact that somatosensory area 2, area 4, premotor area 6 are faster at going into the corpus callosum and also are faster in going into the thalamus and into the internal capsule than other areas. So this is the old story, and I could really, uh, you know, stop here, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of an idea of what the data look like. So here you see at histograms of uh, velocities, which were measured uh, in these uh, studies, and you see that there are areas which are, oops, there are areas which have axons with higher conduction velocity in meters per second here, particularly the motor areas, somatosensory areas, and other areas are slow in conduction velocity. And, uh, and then the important parameter here is the length of the pathway, which was done in histological material, but just the track the tracing from section to section, the trajectory of the axons. And what you see here are axons originating in the primary visual areas that's going toward the corpus callosum. They take this very strange trajectory. They go backward first, and then they go forward into and toward the midline. Um, because this length of the pathways is an important element in the dynamics, so in the conduction velocity and the time that it takes to go from one point to another point, uh, more recently, and this is work which is not published yet, will appear in Journal of Neuroscience, we have tried to compare the um, uh, anatomical data to the in vivo uh, data obtained with uh, DTI. And you see here examples of DTI uh, track tracing in the monkey brain, done by my colleagues in in Rome. And it is nice that actually the two assessments come to, I can't see you when I'm turning back. Okay. So you, you touch me on my shoulder. Okay. The, um, you see here that if you measure histologically or if you measure with DTI, the length of the pathways in the monkey brain look rather the same. And then the, the um, delay times that you can calculate rather look the same. The difference here being with the visual projection, where the DTI technique is not, is not identifying this kind of backward and forward loops that we see in the histology. Uh, this is the callosal midline delay. You have seen them in another way in the previous sections, which really tells you that there are shorter delays and faster conduction to callosal midline in motor and somatosensory areas than in the areas of mid-temporal, anterior temporal, posterior temporal cortex. Now, you can say this is, okay, this is anatomy, but does it relate in any way to electrophysiology? So have we got an electrophysiological data to validate, to compare with? And to some extent we have. And it's interesting, for example, the 
to compare our estimates of conduction velocities to the um, internal capsule with this work which was done by uh, studying antidromic invasion and delays by antidromic invasion in Area 4, the monkey, uh, by, by Humphrey and Curry in 1978. And what they had here is the um, range of conduction velocities, which then they corrected, uh, taking into account the bias that the electrophysiological analysis, analysis introducing. And see here our estimates of conduction velocity based in histology. And what it is sort of surprising to us is that we don't see this very uh, fast conduction velocity axons in our study. So this is the only difference that I could say we can see with the electrophysiological data. The reason might be that uh, the electrophysiology was done in the hand representation of the motor cortex and our injections were actually in the trunk of the motor cortex. So there might be... Good, thank you. I'm done. The, the next slide simply shows uh, another way of comparing data, this is uh, comparing electrophysiological data obtained with antidromic invasion in the monkey by the group of Swadlow. Uh, you see a work in the 70s, and you see that our estimates and their measurement really completely correspond. And you also see that uh, in, in these studies of the visual cortex of the macaque and the visual cortex of human, as we have predicted, the uh, motor cortex is faster in transmitting information to the other side than the uh, visual cortex. So it looks as if there is at least some kind, of, some kind of correspondence between the anatomical data that we produced and the electrophysiological data which are available. And I could continue this story in several different directions, but obviously I don't have time. But I'm glad if you shoot me down with some questions. I may have a quick question for Giorgio while we switch, switch over. Yeah. Up here. Did you develop any uh, hypothesis as to the uh, functional implications of this? Uh, yes. The functional implication is rather far-fetched, <laughs> and, and it is the following. Is I believe that the primary sketch of ourselves is essentially motor and somatosensory. The information which is processed in these areas is faster, and everything which is coming later on, you know, it has to match this sort of ten temporal template. And it also turns out that these connections, at least between the two hemispheres, uh, between motor uh, and, and somatosensory areas, develop earlier than the other connections of the, of the brain, and particularly the prefrontal and association areas connections. So this is the you know, speculation that I can offer to you. OK, we should move on. Let's thank Giorgio one more time. Our next speaker is uh, Gael Verico. Uh, he'll be talking about mining fMRI databases. Thank you very much. Is this on? Yes. OK, excellent. Thank you. So if you think about how we accumulate data uh, across uh, publications, how we accumulate knowledge uh, on brain areas, uh, the way basically it's done is through experts that know the literature very well and uh, come up with conclusions. So there have been more uh, uh, systematic way of uh, doing this uh, that have, have actually been uh, presented earlier today, which uh, rely on mining coordinate databases. So basically accumulating coordinates uh, across papers, and then uh, either define activated regions uh, uh, for specific questions or look at co-activated uh, networks. So what I'm interested in is in mining uh, brain images. So if you think of it, each year uh, we have thousands of brain main images that we're uh, uh, accumulating that amount to uh, petabytes of data. And there are a variety of projects that uh, nowadays share this data. So the data is there. Uh, the challenge is that it's extremely homogene in, in homogeneous data, heterogeneous data. So you have uh, uh, all kind of different paradigms. Uh, and I'm only sticking to fMRI for, for this talk. Uh, and uh, things like resting state. Uh, so the questions I'd like to address are, how do we summarize this data? And specifically, uh, how can we uh, map functionally distinct uh, brain uh, units? So I'll first talk a bit about how we can uh, learn uh, uh, parcellations from uh, resting state data. And the specific problem, in my opinion, of resting state data is that it has no salient feature. If you look at the data, well, you can see structures, but you can't. So structures like, uh, uh, say, uh, uh, the um, 
the ventricles, but it's hard to, it doesn't separate out uh, different functional systems by itself. So the way we can think of it is that it's actually uh, displaying a, a mixture of different cognitive uh, networks. Uh, so what we're observing is uh, uh, different networks that are uh, added up uh, uh, with random time courses. And so the challenge here is going to be to unmix uh, the network. And this is not new. People have been doing this with ICA for years. Uh, but we like to uh, tackle this with uh, sparse dictionary learning. And the idea is that we're going to do uh, joint learning of uh, time courses and networks. And uh, for this learning, we're going to uh, use a sparsity because it's a good way of uh, uh, thinking of uh, functional segregation. So basically, the maps are sparse. Only They recruit only a few number of uh, voxels at the brain level. Uh, one thing that we've done is to add a two-layer model on this and say, well, the subject-specific networks uh, are actually uh, uh, derived from group level networks. Uh, and when we do this, the nice thing is that we get at the level of uh, the population an atlas of uh, brain uh, networks or brain regions. But at the level of the subject, we get the subject specific. And so this is from uh, real data. And what you can see is that the outline of the corresponding subject level uh, a region actually uh, outlines better uh, uh, the cortex that we can see uh, in the background. So uh, if we look at the different uh, uh, brain, uh, the different maps that we get, so we get uh, a segmentation of the uh, primary areas. So this is, this is not surprising. We get things like the default mode network. This is well known. More interestingly, we get uh, something that looks pretty much like a probabilistic segmentation of, gray mat of white matter. While we're looking at EPI signal, of white matter has a different uh, 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 noise structure. And something that, in the beginning, I used to, to think that those small dots were uh, uh, noise, things that I didn't want to see. But if you look at them closer, they're actually a uh, segmentation of the vascular system. So uh, it's not a neural structure, so you may not be interested in it, but it's in our, in our signal, and we're separating it really well. And so what we find is that what's really hard, actually, out of average data to get at is, uh, is the basal ganglia. And you can see here that we're getting them out pretty well. So if we look at uh, what I like to call a, a hard assignment, so we're affecting uh, uh, each voxel to a region, what we get is a parcellation. And we can easily compare it to other approaches. And what's most interesting is to look at the basal ganglia, because as I said, they're amongst the hardest things to, to separate out. And this kind of convinces us that on average quality data, uh, our method is, is actually really interesting. All right. So a lot of data that we have and that we think is interesting is actually composed of the activation maps. It's not resting state. And one question that we wanted to ask is, given a large multi-subject experiment, can we get more information than the mean effect across the group? Because if we've acquired, if we scan a lot of subjects, there is probably a lot of information in this, in this data. So the model that I'd like to put forward is that the response to the different stimuli, so the brain maps, is actually a composition of different atomic uh, uh, cognitive units. And because of functional degeneracy across subjects, uh, uh, the way uh, each subject is going to uh, 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 compose uh, a response and therefore uh, uh, create the corresponding activation, that is going to vary across subjects. So we have a set of different loadings across subjects. And, and from a, a statistical standpoint, the challenge is how do we learn these loadings and that's going to give us a new unmixing problem that can be caused in a specific dictionary learning problem. So I won't go into the details. I'll just show the results on a specific uh, data set that we call the localizer data set. So uh, the specificity of this data set is that it's actually a very short acquisition, five minutes, with only five contrasts that uh, we run on uh, many subjects in my institute. So it's not very rich. In terms of co cognitive content, we've got very simple contrasts like some visual tasks, some computation or reading tasks, some motor tasks. And so we have only, one, only five contrasts. And what we're going to try to do is to extract 50 cognitive atoms and the corresponding maps. So we're extracting 10 times more maps than we have contrasts. So we get 50 of them. I'm not going to display all of them, but these are a few of the interesting ones. So th I found that there were none that were completely uninteresting, some that were more interesting than others. So this is the language network. We all know it. What's nice is the way that it's loaded on the original uh, experiments. 
So uh, uh, we have it loaded more on auditory than visual and uh, more on words than uh, checkerboard. So it makes sense. Uh, dorsal attentional network, fairly well-known network. I found really interesting that it's loaded on computation. We actually know from psychology that computation is a visual special task. So it's not surprising if we know our psychology, but it's not something that I would personally have come up with. Uh, salience network, uh, we have a very clear salience network here, and it's loaded on computation, so this all makes sense. So we do a hard assignment, and we get an atlas uh, of brain region. And the nice, nice thing of this atlas is that every region is linked to a cognitive profile. And so we're breaking down systems like the visual system uh, with different loadings. And we have, for instance, that uh, uh, checkerboards, horizontal versus vertical, are more loaded in what I believe here is V2. So this sort of makes sense. All right. So before I conclude, I'd like to talk a bit about uh, software. Uh, so I've shown you that we're making progress into developing uh, complex machine learning algorithms. Uh, so that's the algorithmic part. The problem we have is that we want to tackle petabytes of data, and we also want to get this, these IDs out of our lab. So we're leveraging, we're developing a, a different open source uh, project one which is really new, it's not, it's not even available yet, but the web page is there is Nylearn, which is going to be machine learning for, for neuroimaging, and it leverages Scikit-Learn, which is one of the references toolkits uh, for machine learning, all open source optimized. All right, so to conclude, I think that using spatially crafted diction learning techniques uh, is a great tool to do uh, uh, brain atlasing by mining uh, big image databases and we've adapted it to resting state and activation map. But the good news is that the data sets that we've used so far are fairly small, and these are very pre preliminary data, uh, preliminary results. So I think that we're going to be getting much better proscillations in the long run. Thank you. Any quick questions for Gail? So in the, the sparse uh, dictionary, that, that's sparsity in space? It is sparsity in space. Is, it, is that the magic? Because that, you're getting these nice results on only 30 subjects. Is that the, you know, the special uh, sauce there? Yeah, I found, I found well, it, it won't, it, it's not enough. We actually do much more. But I found that, yeah, mo my personal opinion is that moving from independence to sparsity for very technical reasons, technical reason that, that basically boils down to sparsity is a well-defined prior, whereas independence is not. And you can combine it with other things. So you get rid of the PCA set, basically. That is the secret sauce, in my opinion. All right, let's name that all again. The secret sauce. Secret sauce. All right, and next up is Cameron Grodick uh, from the Child Mind Institute and Nathan Klein Institute for Psychiatric Research um, and the NeuroBureau. You may be telling us about the NeuroBureau Processing <coughs> Initiative. Thank you. Hello, is this thing on? Hi, um, so I'm Cameron Craddock. Uh, so I am a co-founder and member of an organization that's called the NeuroBureau. And uh, for the uninitiated, the NeuroBureau is an international organization that's made up mostly of young neuroscience researchers. And our goal is to foster interdisciplinary disciplinary collaboration as well as open science in the neurosciences. Uh, although we try to be very neuroscience nonspecific, we are mostly uh, neuroimagers uh, currently. But if any of y'all are interested, Please join up. Everybody's a member of the NeuroBureau. Uh, but so the NeuroBureau has been working on a pre-processing initiative. Um, and our goal is, is to develop high quality, well-characterized pre-processed data sets that we can put out into the world for people to do research with. And our goal is, is using these data sets, people will be able to use these to, to benchmark data, uh, use these as benchmark data sets for their tool development, as well as resources for non-neuroimaging brain enthusiasts. So for example, uh, machine learners who would like to use uh, neuroimaging data but don't care about the specifics of whether or not you should do global signal regression, um, as well as to compare and evaluate different processing strategies. So the core of this are data sets that are openly uh, being generated and, and 
uh, put out into the world, openly shared. Um, and so a lot of these are uh, an initiative uh, by the Child Mind Institute and many of my, my colleagues and, and maybe many of the individuals in this room uh, have taken part in some of these um, in the past. But uh, specifically, we're, uh, you know, I'll talk about three here. One of them, the, the first pre-processed initiative was the ADHD 200, which is a data set of uh, 530, I'm sorry, 375 individuals with ADHD, as well as 598 typically developing controls. And so when the ADHD 200 data set came out, this was aggregated across eight sites, and they had a competition to encourage people to use it. And the competition, there were two challenges. One of the challenges was for machine learners to come up and, and try to come up with the best classifier that could distinguish ADHD from healthy controls, as well as subtype ADHD. Um, and the uh, they also had another competition that was more of uh, just a neuroscientific product. So, you know, somebody does, uses the data to come up with do a neuroscientific exploration, um, you know, test the hypothesis and the data. But what clearly became uh, uh, apparent, or quickly became apparent, is that there was a barrier to entry into these competitions. And that barrier was a lot of the people that would, would be interested in, in competing in such a challenge don't know specifically how to use resting, resting state fMRI data, don't know how to pre-process it, don't know how to do these things. So our first initiative, there were uh, three different uh, groups that went put together to pre-process this data and make it available for uh, competition uh, participants. Uh, since then, uh, we, through the Indy initiative, there's a data set, a very large data set of uh, DTI data that has been processed by one of my colleagues in Hungary uh, and made available. And currently we're working on the Abai data set, which is 539 uh, individuals with autism and 574 controls. So when we're doing this, we're taking a multi-pipeline approach. So the first initiative that we did, uh, the ADHD 200, there are actually three pipelines uh, using, uh, so one was based on uh, FSL and AFNI, the other one was based on a variety of MEEK tools using Pierre Bellic's uh, phenomenal pipelining system, NIAC and PSOM. Um, and as well, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Carl Tenshu, put together uh, a BVM data set using SPM. Um, so for Abide, we've actually extended the number of different pre-processing initiatives uh, that we're including. So now we have uh, the AFNI and FSL using CPAC, which is based off of Satra's NIPIPE source, and, and I've, I've been showing this here, uh, as well as um, Pierre is going to uh, use his MINK tools again. And we have another colleague that builds DPARFs and REST, which is based on SPM, uh, that's going to provide a pipeline. Um, as well as we have, we're going to have more cortical measures uh, this year. So uh, Alan Evans and a, and a group at M&I are using CIVIT to extract all the, 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 the cortex for these individuals. And also we have um, a group doing free server out of China. So anyway, so this data will be available, the Abide data, in, in various derivatives. Um, so we, you know, from the functional data, we're doing things like the sort of the, the normal things that you would expect. So here, you know, some of the examples of, of the data that we'll be generating, things like ALFF, FLFF, Reho, voxel mirror homotopic connectivity, um, as well as, you know, uh, distinct maps that are commonly uh, made available, and uh, as well as time courses for various parcellations of the brain. And using those parcellations, you can visualize the connect on this way, which is obviously insufficient compared to the hives. Um, and, as well as, well, we have the DTI data in the various formats. So also with the DTI data, we have full probabilistic tracking data from FSL. So you can do and look at the tracks if you like and come up with another hive plot. Um, and so that's, that's basically the idea. So uh, some of the initiatives for this year, for the next one are, is that we're going to try to do extremely careful quality control. One of the things that we sort of punted on with our first initiative was QC, and our justification was that we would allow people to do quality control themselves. But if we're presuming people don't know how to work with this data, they probably don't know how to quality control it. Um, so what we're working on is very careful inspection so that we can come up with quality control scores and essentially hand label the quality control. And then hopefully this will be a valuable resource for other researchers to come up with automatic pro uh, procedures for doing quality control or coming up with better quality control metrics for neuroimaging data, which we sorely need. Um, so the availability of this data, so we've been in a, in a pretty good partnership with Nitric. Uh, they've been handling a lot of our, uh, a lot of our, our um, data storage request, even though I know that we frustrate them quite a bit. But the, uh, so it's, it's, uh, so the ADHD 200, the DTI data are currently available um, at the, the NeuroBureau project on Nitric. Um, hopefully we're working on trying to get it into the cloud uh, so that people could directly access the data from there. Um, as I, uh, so, so far to sort of give you, uh, to give you a sense of how successful this project has been, so the winning team from the uh, ADHD 200 was a group of biostatisticians that had never really worked with neuroscience data before or neuroimaging data before, uh, and, uh, so, and they used our data and, and won the competition. 
So far, our, our count is there's been at least 10 peer-reviewed publications. And one of them, and, and one of them's a group. There's one guy, um, Jao Sato. I, I'm not good at his name. He's Brazilian. But I think he's got like three or four publications on it. And so he contacted me. And, and from his, his perspective, it's just using this resource as a way to quickly test his algorithms and get them out. Um, and so he's been a really successful user of it. Uh, we've had quite a few downloads to give you an idea here. Some of them, there's actually a dot in Cuba, which we're pretty excited about. We got to Cuba. We haven't gotten into Africa yet, though. I'm really disappointed about that. Um, but anyway, there's the future, right? No penguins in Antarctica, unfortunately, are using our data. Uh, but as I, as I mentioned, so that uh, part of what we've done through uh, with the FSL and AFNI is based on um, an open source uh, project that I've been working on. It's a pipeline that is based on NiPy, but it's a specific pipeline for doing connectomes analysis um, that is available. I had a demo earlier. It's late now, so I can still show you stuff if you like. Uh, but anyways, so to check it out, it's pretty good. It's developed on GitHub, so you can fork it and do what you will with it. Um, also, I'd like to bring your attention to Brain Hack. So the Neuro Bureau hosts a Brain Hack every year, and this is for uh, interdisciplinary brain enthusiasts to get together and work on projects, actual neuroscience projects. Um, and so we, we try to make some data available for people to work on, have some organized projects if people would like those. But mostly, it's a workshop where there's no structure, there's very few talks, and most of the time is spent actually in open uh, discourse. With, uh, with colleagues. And so this year it's going to be in Paris, and I believe it's, a, it's an old, like, a royal castle. It's a it's fantastic setting, I know. But uh, so check out if you're available during those weeks, come to Paris and hack a few brains with us. Um, and I think that's everything I have. Cameron has left ample time for questions. Do we have, have any questions? So the natural one is, so you've now analyzed the same data in a gazillion different ways, and... <laughs> you know, uh, this is why, this is why we need you, Tom. This is why we need you, is to come up with the multiple comparison correction for, for everybody using the same data over and over and over again. Well, I'll just say, are you, are you uh, sort of scared by how different the re results are, or do you generally get the same things out, or...? or? Uh, well, so, you know, honestly, we haven't systematically done that, and that's what needs to be done. So with the Abide data, that is what we're planning on doing when we release that data, is to actually do a systematic comparison of the different preprocessings to get a sense of how different they are. Um, I know preliminarily for two of the pipelines, the DPARPs and the CPAC, that at least our data derivatives, I mean, not the results from the group analysis, but the, the inputs to the group level analysis, actually agree very, very well. Um, and we're still waiting on that comparison for the mean tools. Great. Let's thank Cameron one more time. Okay, and our next speaker is Kit Chung from Imperial College London, and he'll be talking to us about NeuroFlow. Hi, everybody. I'm Kit uh, from Imperial College. Uh, I'm under a custom computing group, which um, mainly use FPGAs to speed up uh, various kind of applications, and also in uh, neural coding lab, which uh, uh, do uh, various type of uh, um, biological experiments on mouses, mice. And um, so one very interesting question is, what if we've got enough computing power in a single electronic chip so that we can just build a um, brain chip into our head? We can just remove our cerebral cortex and then replace it with one or maybe two of the brain chips. And it's um, maybe termed cortex. Um, but it won't be out for 100 years, I think. So, but the, the, uh, that is just science fiction. But <clears throat> the um, now more recent researchers uh, doing large-scale simulation of spiking neural networks has uh, found some very interesting applications, like the Spawn, which is just out in the last year, has been using 2.3 million spiking neurons and is able to uh, carry out six cognitive tasks in a single uh, neural network model, and like counting or memory, mem remembering uh, different uh, numbers, etc. And also, Isikovic has been building a biologically detailed model and you, to investigate the dynamics of uh, different brain states. Um, there's a genuine motivation for building uh, a, a large network because in order to understand something, you need to build one. So if you don't build a brain, then you can't really understand how it works. So it also uh, 
for a large network, you, it also uh, supports some functional networks, and also you can uh, explore the dynamics of larger networks. And also, it's, um, there is some biological plausibility, like the connection probability is not going to uh, be the same for smaller networks. And, but now the problem is, so previous people use CPUs, or uh, if, you, uh, if you don't uh, get um, enough parallelization, you use multi-cores, and then even if you don't get um, enough parallelization, you use GPUs. But uh, seldom, seldomly people talk about FPGAs as a possible candidate for this type of uh, processing uh, challenges. So, so basically, FPGAs has a number of um, advantages over GPUs and also CPUs. It allows reconfiguration and low-level uh, customization, and it's easy to scale up. But uh, the, major, the major problem is, is um, the programming difficulty, which is, you can see on the right-hand side, the, uh, the, the x-axis is the programming difficulty, the y-axis is the performance. So it's very hard conventionally to program an FPJ. You use very low-level uh, languages like uh, Verilog or VXDL to program an FPGA. But now, the, uh, some sort of CAD or uh, some developer tools have been evolved. Now, some people have been using FPGA as easy as a multi-core CPU or, uh, or GPU, so that uh, uh, the, in the uh, particular uh, system that I've been using is the Java to, uh, which is, uh, I type Java code to describe the data flow, the computation flow of the different computations in the FPGA, so that it then compiles into configurations in the FPGA. And now it allows faster development time, so it becomes a more attractive candidate for such type of uh, such computation. And uh, we've purchased this, uh, the math node in the middle, which consists of four math-free cards on the left-hand side of this uh, uh, slide. And, um, each of these mass free cards contain one FPGA and 24 gigabyte of uh, memory. So it's specialized for high performance and data intensive tasks with low power consumption comparing to CPUs or GPU uh, uh, counterparts. And also it has a very special uh, streaming programming uh, model which enables a deep pipeline for the, for the uh, computation. And also, it, unlike some of the customized um, platforms, it is off the shelf. You can just buy it and then install it into uh, your lab, and then it saves time to build your new system. And then um, it also provides fast network so that you can build a number of, uh, uh, you can use a multi node implementation to build your uh, um, FPGA based uh, neural network accelerator. So um, to introduce my, my platform, um, it is the overview of it. So it's a very uh, standardized uh, kind of time-driven simulation of uh, point neurons like Isikovich or Integrated Fires model. One cycle of it, it corresponds to uh, delta t, usually it's just uh, one millisecond. So you calculate, it, uh, calculate the uh, delta v, which then add to your previous value to update the neuronal states. And then, <clears throat> same as other uh, type of um, accelerators, it also provides some parallelization, like uh, for the, such as the uh, parallelization of this uh, differential equation, and also I've done some preformatting of the memory content so that uh, the memory access is speeded up. And the hardware is, uh, I've just mentioned, is four FPGAs and 96 gigabytes of DDR3 RAM. And now, uh, most uh, important function that I've included in this platform is uh, nearest neighbor STDP, which uh, many people find it hard to include in uh, some uh, real-time performance systems. And also, it supports some various uh, post-symmetric current kernels, like experiential or alpha function or your, or, or your custom functions or a custom kernel which you can um, build for your neural network. Um, this is the major computation flow for my uh, platform. So uh, in a single cycle of one, one millisecond, 
uh, it contains two phases. The first one is the calc phase, which you just parallelize the uh, differential equation. You just fetch the uh, neuronal states from the memory, and then uh, you just update, update it. And then you get a, the, a list of fired neurons. It should be indexes of uh, fired neurons. And then you get this uh, list of fired neurons. You then uh, go to the memory and then fetch those um, uh, associated synaptic waves from the memory and store it into the um, uh, on-chip memory. So for a multi-FPJ multi uh, Multi-FPJ implementation, I've used a very easy, uh, simple uh, state machine we, because our platform now is just a, uh, has a uh, FPJ to FPJ connection which connects them as a ring. Then I can just use a very simple um, state machine to pass the neuron indexes around the, the, uh, between the FPGAs. And also, the SDP uh, has some. Um, <coughs> um, I've made use of FPGA and the CPU's uh, cap uh, advantages in assessing memory. For instance, here um, the um, CPU uses um, a uh, CPU got a lot more cache, so it's faster to assess ran uh, the memory, to assess the memory randomly. And FPGA is us. Uh, um, more faster in processing the um, memory linearly. So I combined the, these two advantages and uh, achieved this one, two, three, four, and four, this flow of computation for STDP. OK. And um, we've got some hardware customizations because it's not like CPU or GPUs. It's got limited uh, hardware resources, so we have to uh, make, use, make use of the most resources possible. And also now uh, we've got the um, hardware platform going, and we can we now uh, add an extra layer of pine so that it achieves like um, the the neuronal. Uh, you can you can support different uh, neuronal population which share neuronal parameters, and also current injector or different sorts of uh, random um, uh, different functions to it. And this is the compilation flow. If you fit in. This, um, this, um, the flow of the compilation, you just fit in the pi, a pine description here. It produces a host code memory file and hardware description. Hardware description will be compiled to, uh, the, to be the configuration of the FPGA, and also the memory will be loaded to the memory file, will be loaded to the chip memory for the system. And currently, um, the neural flow is um, um, for a uh, 98,000 neurons. It achieves a three times, uh, three point five uh, times speed up uh, 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 performance for um, for neural flow, and it's around double of that of the GPU, which is uh, of the same uh, using the same uh, forty nanometer uh, processor. So um, it's relatively attractive to use FPGAs. And there are some other customized platforms like the Spinnaker, which is from uh, Manchester, which is quite famous. They've got um, this uh, very huge range of um, different uh, requirements for real-time uh, computation, and also a, a 16 FPGA um, uh, platform for 256,000 neurons in real-time for, for FPGAs. And the performance speed up for uh, my platform is um, 400,000 neurons to be ca calculated in real time, and it supported a 800,000 neurons, which is correspond to around 616 millimeter cube. But yeah, it's, it's just a an approximation. And as the as the size goes fast uh, larger, then of course the the um, the performance drops, but uh, it's around uh, 0 0.5 for a 1,000 uh, random synapses and for for FPGAs. So the major drawback is um, um, it's pretty hard to convert a algorithm from CPU based to FPGA based. So you need to 
do some parallelization or some uh, streaming effort to uh, to avoid loops in your programming. And also, it's harder to debug. Uh, and the major drawback, I think, for most of the people is it requires 10 hours of compilation time. But if you use the same uh, design, you, you just change the data set, uh, you don't need to compile it. Now, we are migrating it to a new uh, 6 FPJ platform and going to do some uh, sort of uh, modeling work onto the platform. And in summary, uh, I've introduced that uh, FPJ as a very attractive platform for, um, for neural simulation uh, for this task. And we have uh, introduced some low-level customization and fine-grained parallelization, but also we can do some high-level com computation, and we can do the things that the high other high-level platforms can is able to do. Thank you. OK, thank you. OK, one uh, quick question up here. Okay. OK, so you're saying that you're using a Java library to compile your, let's say, regular code to a PGA, right? Um, it's not a regular Java code. It's a Java code to um, describe a computation flow <laughs> of the inside the FPGA. It's a custom built by the uh, vendor and themselves. How good is this library? So, you, you know, like, how, how good is this FPGA? That's the... How good is it? How good is the code generated by this job? Oh, no, no. It's not a direct translation. It's just a way to, um, it's a, you can treat it as a different language, but it uses Java languages. Or and objects, you can choose this way. Okay, we'll have to leave it. I'm sorry, we'll follow up with Kit later because we had to move on for time. So let's thank Kit one more time. <laughs> okay, our next speaker is Krishnan Padman Appan from the Salk Institute. We'll be talking about large scale whole brain mapping of inputs to the old factory bowl. Hello, can everybody hear me? Uh, great, so I want to thank the organizers for uh, uh, this generous invitation to come talk to you about some of our work. I'm actually going to begin with a neurobiological question and then hopefully motivate that and use that to drive a uh, neuroinformatics uh, question and really talk about some of the work that we've been doing. And so uh, my chief interest in neuroscience is really about understanding sensory coding. And if we think about sensory coding as this problem of taking a complex stimulus, in this case this cheese in the natural world, and then it's filtered through a neural circuit that's uh, made up of a number of neurons, a number of synapses, and uh, it gener those neurons uh, generate some complex pattern of activity. That complex pattern of activity we can analyze and think about in terms of the computations, either in terms of the information that it provides about the stimulus, the pairwise correlations among the spike trains, or some metric that we choose, and hopefully use all of this to try to understand the behavior of the animal. But what I want to do is spe uh, specifically focus on this, on the neural circuit itself. And I think that uh, many of the initiatives that we've talked about and that people have discussed here today are really focused on trying to understand the anatomical connectivity of the brain. Whether it's at the level of EM reconstructions, doing micro um, uh, uh, reconstructions of small regions of uh, a circuit, or whole brain imaging or whole brain mapping. And there's an intermediate uh, problem, which is to try to understand the connectivity between neurons, individual cells, from one brain area to another. And so what we've been doing is actually developing uh, both biological tools as well as computational methods to try to get at this problem. And this challenge of circuit mapping, I think, can be summarized in a very simple way using this cartoon. So imagine two brain areas uh, with neurons in each, and we uh, want to try to understand the connectivity of this neuron to the population of cells in the local area, something that may be possible or tractable using EM. But we also want to try to understand what the connectivity of this cell is to these other areas. And so well, this cell was unlikely connected to all the neurons here and unlikely connected to all of these neurons. But what we really need is a tool that's going to allow us to investigate this wiring diagram. And so I want to begin by talking about some of the biological tools and then talk about some of the computational methods that we're developing and hopefully bring those together to talk about the kinds of research questions that we're using that are motivating um, their integration and hopefully uh, some uh, really exciting work that we're doing uh, that I think is going to take this project forward. Uh, so in terms of the biological tools, we need something that can label circuits, something that can actually label synapses. And on the computational end, we need something that's going to be able to image, in principle, an entire mouse 
brain, including all of the neurons and the structures, perhaps at the level of dendrites and uh, possibly even individual synapses. And so the technique that we've actually been using at the biological end is a tool that was developed in Ed Calloway's lab here at, uh, at the salt where I am, um, and it's the G-deleted rabies virus. And I'll talk about it in just a moment. But it has a number of advantages. First of all, it's transsynaptic. So when we inject this virus into a population of neurons, the virus jumps one synapse, and it labels all the connected cells uh, at that synapse. And so it's highly specific for actual connections. It's, uh, it also fills the entire neuron. And so this virus essentially labels the structure or the morphology of the cell. And the virus can be pseudotyped for high specificity. So not only can we stu study the connections of a cell in a given area, but we can actually study the connections of two subtypes of cells within an area. And on the computational end, what we really need is a way to try to capture all this data, to do high-resolution imaging of the entire mouse brain, and then to automate things like the alignment of that imaging, um, automated cell finding, as well as indexing and hopefully registering it um, to some universal or generic mouse brain, and then use all of this together with some analysis to try to motivate or to drive some uh, questions that are interesting to us. And so I'm going to give you one example of the way in which we're using this to a system that's near and dear to my heart, which is the olfactory system. And what you're looking at here is a cartoon, a schematic of a mouse brain. And the front of the mouse brain is here, and this is the olfactory bulb, which is the first synaptic processing area of olfactory information or odor information from the natural world. This is the back of the brain. And so what we do is we actually make an injection of the rabies virus, the G-deleted rabies virus, into the mouse olfactory bulb, and we target a subpopulation of cells within that area. So what you're looking at here is a coronal section. So we basically chopped a chunk of the brain here in the front, and you're looking in on the brain. In blue are the actual nuclei of individual neurons labeled, and in red is the injection site, the place where we put the rabies virus. And so what we're trying to do is use this technology to try to understand all the neurons that project to or connect to this population of cells that we've labeled. And so if we look further back in our sections, and I apologize for this being a little washed out, um, hopefully you can see this here. There are, are a number of red cells that have been labeled, and these cells are actually millimeters away from the injection site. But they represent synaptic partners to this population of neurons. And if we zoom in a little bit more, what we can see is not only the neurons, but um, in an idealized image, what you would see is actually the dendritic processes of these neurons. So not only do we get the connectivity, the population of cells that's linking to, uh, uh, to this population in the, in the olfactory bulb, but we actually get their morphology. And so we get two pieces of data. Now, the real challenge here is that what you're looking at is a single slice here in one part of the brain and another slice in another part of the brain and a zoom in at a higher resolution in another part of the brain. So, we're looking at little chunks of a complete picture. And what we'd really like to do is to synthesize all of these chunks and put them together in a, in, in a full representation of this circuit. And so what we've been doing is actually reconstructing these entire mouse brains at fairly high resolution, at the resolution of individual dendrites. And what I'm going to show you is a movie of one of those reconstructions. What we did was make a very large injection here in the olfactory bulb. You can see the, one of the hemispheres of the bulb and another hemisphere. And you can actually see that the virus spilled over and labeled the population. If we spin this brain around, what we can see is that the virus travels over entirely large domains, almost all the way to the caudal end of the mouse brain, as well as to the contralateral hemisphere. And so this viral labeling technique actually allows us to get at circuits and the connections between cells over great distances. We can label all the way to the caudal part of the entorhinal cortex, and we can also look at the population of neurons in regions like the piriform and the amygdala. These are actually the areas that you saw in one of those sections, but what we're doing now is actually amassing the information over the entire data set. And to give you a feel for how big these data slides are, or excuse me, these data sets are, um, one of these mouse brains uh, fills up about a terabyte of data, and uh, what we've done is take these mouse brains now and actually try to figure out a way to analyze them. And so uh, without going into details and glossing over things, um, what you're looking at here now is a, a representation of that mouse brain. Each of the individual sections are represented here in gray lines. The front of the mouse is here, the back is here. And this is uh, just the convex hull of those individual sections. And each of these little red points corresponds to one uh, neuron that uh, we found, you, that, that, that's, uh, that's been identified with an algorithm. And uh, when we actually, and uh, all of these neurons 
atoms essentially connect to this location here, which is the injection site. And what we can do is then classify where in the brain these cells belong. And you can find the olfactory bulb, the two um, uh, accessory olfactory nuclei, and the ipsilateral and the contralateral hemispheres that you saw in the previous image, as well as the piriform and the amygdala and uh, other regions of the brain. Oh, great. So um, what we can do then is really use this technology to motivate scientific questions, which is kind of what I'm interested in. And so we can actually change the size or the location of our injections. So here we've made a, a big injection in blue and a small injection in red using two different colors of rabies virus. And if we actually advance this all the way back into the piriform cortex, we're going to zoom out. You're going to start to see the cells up here and the ipsilateral injection here and the uh, ipsilateral injection for the red. And when we spin this brain and look at it from the top, you'll already start to see differences in the distribution of cells. And those differences can only be captured if we have all the data. And so in a sense, we're actually extracting structure by pulling out all of the information about this connectivity. And you can see here that there's a, a clustering of cells here in the front and the uh, blue injection labels neurons much farther into the caudal parts of the brain. And so what we can do is actually represent this by looking at the individual distributions of cells, which are here um, as individual little points. And you can see that there is some structure, and I won't go into the details of how we've classified or how we've quantified the structure, but what we're doing now is really using this complete reconstruction, this, this tool for looking at all of the presynaptic partners, in a sense the connectome of this circuit, um, to try to extrapolate principles about how olfactory computation may be occurring. And so I want to conclude um, by, talk, uh, by saying that we have this great tool in this technology to map the connectivity of cells. It allows us to identify and classify these individual elements, including the neurons. We can reconstruct their morphology. And we can blend this with other techniques, including electrophysiology and imaging, in hopes of getting spatial and temporal data to complement some of the anatomical methods. And I want to talk really briefly about where we're going and um, the way in which we're going forward. And I think one of the really, one of the areas of interest um, that I am particularly excited about is trying to model human diseases. And so we have actually have a collaboration with Fred Gage's lab at the Salk in which what we're doing is actually reprogramming human stem cells and transplanting them in the mouse as a way of studying or modeling psychiatric disorders. And and so you can imagine the complexity of this problem. And so what I'm going to do is just advance this movie. What you're looking at here in blue is the edges of a mouse brain. And these two green spots represent neural precursor cells that were actually transplanted into this mouse brain. And as you spin around, what, you'll, what we'll see is we go from about a centimeter of resolution down to individual processes. Uh, that are being extended from these neural precursors. And I think understanding both the anatomical connectivity of these transplanted neurons, as well as physiological properties, will really give us uh, the kinds of tools that we need to make some headway into understanding some of the neurological, um, uh, some of the uh, uh, neuroanatomical and neurophysiological um, underpinnings of psychiatric disorders. And so uh, none of this would be possible without an incredible group of collaborators. Uh, I'm actually a Crick Jacobs fellow at the Salk. I work with uh, Terry Sanofsky, Ed Calloway, and Fred Gage. Um, uh, Fumitaka Sakata is a, a postdoc that I work with in uh, Ed's lab. And he actually has done all the virus generation. Um, and Carol Marchetto and uh, Bilal are uh, two postdocs in Fred Gage's lab with whom I work to do some of this transplant. And these are all of the uh, past, current, and future funding sources who have been kind enough to let me do this work. So thank you so much, and I'm happy to get some questions. OK, we're running a bit behind, but if we have one question, go ahead. Yes. So the rabies tracing, I'm sorry, the rabies tracing method is retrograde, so it's presynaptic. Yeah, so I, I forgot to mention that, but um, we can actually control it so that we can limit it to jumping only one presynaptic partner back. Um, and that's what allows us to get the specificity of knowing all the presynaptic partners. If we let rabies go indefinitely, we would essentially, in principle, label the entire brain at some point. Um, but yes, it, it's a G-deleted variant, and I can uh, talk to you more about the details of that offline. Great. Thank you. I guess, thank Christian. Okay, our next speaker is Michele Migliori. Uh, he's at Yale University, um, and he's going to be talking to us about building a 3D model 
of the metro granule cell okay. network in the old factory bowl. So more on smell. Okay, thank you. Um, we are interested in building a 3D model of the mitral granule cells uh, uh, as a way to understand higher brain functions. Um, the olfactory bulb is uh, um, uh, one of the most studied systems for, for many reasons. One of these is that uh, it's uh, apparently um, very simple in its organization, although input activate olfactory sensor neurons, which then, then say they activate the, the taft of the mitral cells that sends their axon to the cortex for other recognition. The output of the mitral cells is uh, um, modulated by uh, a large population of interneurons in the granule cells. Uh, which, uh, through the dendrodendritic synapses with the lateral dendrites of the mitral cells, set up the connectivity between uh, granule and mitral in the, in, the, in the olfactory bulb. And uh, it has been shown uh, uh, with viral tracing that this connectivity is not random, is not uniform, but uh, it is composed of uh, a set of uh, distributed synaptic clusters that uh, um, probably are um, uh, um, formed by, by activity-dependent mechanisms, and can, they can be very thin uh, uh, by the sides of, uh, of the single glomerulus. Uh, we have also shown in a model um, that the main mechanism responsible for this kind of connectivity is the interaction between the backpropagation of action potentials along the lateral dendrites of the mitral cell with the local activity of the granule cells. Using this mechanism, we have been able to show in a, in a, a larger but still one-dimensional system um, and taking data uh, from the experiments done on the dorsal part of the bulb for about 70 odors and uh, about 70 individual glomeruli. And uh, we have been able to um, uh, explain several experimental findings that predict new results on the effect of lateral inhibition on the network self organization during a lot of presentation, or the formation of synaptic cluster as observed in the experiments, or the spike time distribution following single sniffs uh, during auto presentation in uh, single mitral cells. But the problem is that, uh, as uh, in many other systems, uh, if you want to study uh, microcircuits, uh, this requires a new generation of 3D computational models. And uh, so, for, in this case, the olfactory bulb is an excellent model because uh, the, its investigation for natural odors requires a full 3D, 3D implementation because natural odors um, activate a large portion of the bulb. So in order to do this model, we need two, basically two kinds of uh, uh, input data, two, two kinds of experimental data. One is for uh, the input that drives the network to self-organize, and, uh, and we got this from the Alan Carlton lab uh, for 128 glomeruli at about 20 natural odors. And uh, we need also a full reconstruction of mitral cells. And this is not easy task, because uh, in the Kensaku Mori lab, we gave us a few mitral cells. It takes two months the, the, to process a single cell in its entire full genetic range. So we got these cells, we extract the, um, statistical parameters, such as the growing direction of the dendrites, the path length, the branch length, the bifurcation probability. And this is what we think this method is quite general, because it does not depend on the kind of population that you want to, to synthesize. But uh, as long as you have experimental constraint, you can apply, as I, I will show you in a few slides, for Purkinje cells, for example, you can grow a network for uh, building a 3D model of uh, the cell for example. Uh, so, um, w with this data corrected in such a way that uh, the cell will grow according to the, um, to the system that you want to model, for in this case, an ellipsoid for, for the bulb, you can get metal cells which are indistinguishable statistically from the real cells. And uh, this is a you can grow basically in a limited number of mitral cells in 3D. And build your bulb. So the model um, is a fully integrated uh, neuron plus Python parallel implementation. And a typical 20 second simulation uh, for with uh, six, about 600 mitral, 40,000 40, granules, and 1.5 million synapses takes about three hours on 2,000 processor on a blue gene with 90, 98% efficiency. Let me quit a little bit for a while, for a couple of minutes, to show you the, an interactive view of the model. 
So this is a full 3D model in the, using a, a public domain software, Mayavi 2. And uh, uh, so let's start with the... Uh, of course, we are also modeling the full set of 1800 glomeruli, but uh, we are waiting for experimental data to include them in the model. At this point, we are using only 128 for which we have the raw data. Uh, if we look at the single module, okay, so this is a single module, the set of granules that is connected to it. And uh, we can do other things with this nice graphical interface. If we connect an history, a simulation file with, the, with this interface, we can ask what's going on at this granule cell, for example, which is connected to this dendritic segment. And uh, this is the time evolution over 20 seconds in this case, and the firing rate of the granule and the mitral at this position. Or we can ask what's going on at this dendritic segment to see. In this case, there are two granule cells. And these are the history files. So if we look at the network, I have to be within the one minute warning flash. Yeah, good. So this again is uh, uh, it's not the entire system, of course. It's just uh, a couple of glomer glomeruli and a few metal cells just to show you the, uh, how the system is uh, organized. And uh, of course, we can also do some nice thing to compare directly the, our simulations with experimental data. We can do, for example, a slice. Okay. So in doing this, we can realize then in doing, when you do, when in the experiments you do a slice, you are losing most of the dendrites of the metal cells that, that you are studying. Okay, so if we want to look at our system, at our model, at our simulations in another way, we can do, again, using only public domain software, we can do a, a simulation of the of, a, of a sniffing for a, um, a larger system, but uh, still not the full system for, for visualization purposes. In this case, there are just a few glomeruli and one mitral per glomerulus, and a couple of sniffs will give us a, a, a way to look at the network activity uh, and the signal propagation uh, with time during another presentation. By applying the same, exactly the same algorithm to Purkinje cells, We get this. On the left, there are real cells. On the right is our uh, implementation of uh, just the two sheets of, uh, of, uh, of Purkinje cells. Yeah. What? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Less than one minute to show the conclusion that uh, um, we have devised the method uh, using experimental constraint to implement the computational model of factory bulb microcircuits. And the, the most important part is that. Uh, uh, in this case, realistic neural elements interact in a 3D space. So we, are, uh, we think that we are implementing and uh, can study in a much better way the real system. The simulation runs very efficiently on supercomputers, and the model can be easily expanded, of course, to further refine the system by adding uh, uh, more kind of neurons or mechanisms or ion channels and so on. And the method is general enough to be used for implementation of other brain systems. Thank you. Questions for Michele? I think for the sake of time, we'll just go on to the next uh, speaker. Let's thank Michele one more time. Okay, uh, our next speaker is uh, Shri Joy Tripathi from uh, Carnegie Mellon University. He'll be talking about us uh, about reusable <laughs> experiments. Hi. Uh, Thanks for having me come to talk to you guys. Um, yeah. So I'm going to talk about making the results of small data um, reusable. So uh, you know, as neuroinformaticists, we've developed a lot of great tools for data sharing. Like we have like the CRCNS website. We have this data space thing we've heard a lot about. Um, but I I think that like these these resources are really great, but they're really underutilized. Um, you know, for like all the terabytes of data that gets produced across all the labs that do neuroscience, maybe like one percent of 0.1, 0.001% of all that data are in these really great resources. 
Um, and that's because there are like legit barriers to data sharing. Like, for example, there's like social barriers, like someone will say, well, why should I share my data with you? What's in it for me? Like, what if I get scooped? Or like, hey, it's my data, get your own data. Um, so like, like, these are real barriers and yeah, they're real. And then there's also like methodological barriers, like that just right now it's, it's really hard to share data, even though we have those great resources. Like there's questions that like experimentalists have like, that are like, how, you know, how do I share data? What do I share? Or going back and annotating my experiments in a way that they'd be useful to someone else is really time consuming. So it's not really worth my, you know, like my time investment to do that. Um, I think as informaticians, like, you know, we could really work on these methodological issues and then, you know, like yell at our funding agencies to work on the social issues. But uh, we need to do both. Um, so I want to talk about some of the methodological issues. So this is the, the idea for the project we have. Um, it's basically an experiment. It's that what can we do to make a standard run-of-the-mill neuroscience lab more data sharing savvy? Okay, so the idea is we're going to go into my lab, my lab at the urban lab at, at Carnegie Mellon. We do slice electric physiology, and we're going to incorporate structured workflows and informatics and all these really cool things. And uh, we're going to try and make us like make it to a point where like our, it's, it'd be really easy for my lab to share the data open, openly on on the web. And we want to know what does it take, um, and where are the points of conflict. So like this is again this is like sort of a social experiment. Uh, so the insights and motivations to this um, is that you can't just share if you want to if you want to share data you can't just share like the you know the raw MATLAB file with like for, for example like the voltage traces. You have to also share the metadata. And for us that's in like literally physical lab notebooks. So you know, if I want to share my data with like Steven or something, I'd have to send him just my, my data file and also like maybe images of the lab notebook. Uh, and that's just a fact of life. Like the, the, the metadata is in, the lab note, in, is in these lab notebooks. Um, the second motivation is that you know the most about an experiment as you're performing it. Um, right now, sort of the, I guess the plan for data sharing is that people are like, oh, hey, I'll share my data after my paper's accepted. But by that time, they've sort of moved on and they've more or less forgotten what they did or how their data is stored. Uh, and so if you're going to do something to make data sharing possible, like the earlier you do it in the experimental, like in the experiment's lifetime, the better, the better you are you are. Um, and the, the last motivation is that uh, if a lab that sort of practices the best practice for data sharing should be more productive. So the, like the way most wet lab neuroscience goes is like a single investigator sort of collects some data, maybe like 50 or so neurons, and they publish a paper, and that's great. So if, for example, a journal of neurophysiology, which is an okay journal in my field. Um, but I argue that like if you um, like if you sort of practice these best practices, then you can sort of work with more people. So you can work with say your lab mates. You can pull your data across your lab mates, or pull data across your collaborators down the street, maybe across the world. And then these people working together can maybe get a better paper, like in Nature. Uh, and so like this is you know like this is good. Like everyone's sort of going for like. Uh, you know, like we want more productivity, and we have to, like, to sell this data sharing argument to wet lab scientists. I think this is the way to do it. Um, you know, like we will make each scientist more productive. So anyway, that, those are the ideas. Um, so our schematic, or the project schematic, is that uh, you know, like this is the standard uh, electrophysiology data acquisition pipeline. It's just you. There's a neuron. You have a computer. You record data from it. Okay, and these, this is what we've added to this project, or the, added to this. So our key innovation is the, the idea of storing metadata on lab notebooks, like tablets, okay? So rather than uh, storing metadata in a physical lab notebook with pen and paper, you're gonna store it electronically on a tablet. Um, and, then, and so now, then, like, when you store metadata on your tablet, then you have like, a data file that's just like, the, that's the experimental file plus your metadata file. You can sort of put those together in some cloud-based data server. Um, and when we do this, we can also incorporate uh, semantic technologies into our, uh, into our um, electronic lab notebook. Uh, and so like, when you have all this data in one central place and you do cool things with it, like visualize it um, in, in interesting ways and like, list the experiments, and you can sort of like, mash up the data in ways you couldn't before when you just had like, the, the data from like, a single investigator. Okay, so, okay, so, 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 so this is, the, this is our, our, our metadata data app. What I'm showing, uh, again, it's, like a, it's an electronic lab notebook running on tablets. Um, and so like, and, and, and the way we engineer this app is it, it sort of matches the workflow of slice electrophysiology, where you first prepare your animal, then you cut slices, and then you pull electrodes, and then you record from neurons. And so each of those, each of those sort of parts of the experiment are captured in the app. Um, and and the, the reason why you want, to, you want to use an electronic lab notebook versus a, a pen and paper lab notebook is that it allows structured data entry. So, um, so, so in my lab, we use, we use transgenic mouse strains, and where uh, you know, individual cells can be labeled with GFP. And, and so like, rather than sort of scribbling that down into your lab notebook, what was your, what was your animal strain, you enter that via pushing buttons on this app. 
Um, and so, for example, uh, you know, like they would push like a, you know, like one of these, like one of the one of the things on the app, and then that would register that they were using um, um, like that strain of mouse. And doing it in this structured way allows us to easily incorporate semantic, semantic technologies. So, for example, if you were like to to um, tag mouse strains, we should tie that in to the uh, the mouse genomes informatics database, which is just a listing of of mouse strains and unique identifiers. So, th you know, this this is great. Like, and we sort of do this with all the attributes in our in the app. We can like directly tie them onto like their semantic, their semantic equivalents. Um, but in, in making this making this lab notebook structured. Like it's important to strike a balance between flexibility and rigidity, or flexibility and yeah, and rigidity. Um, like if it's too rigid, then the experiment is going to be like, hey, screw you, I'm going to go back to my lab notebooks. But but it, you know, but like by making it structured, that we can sort of do, we can we can use that structure later on. Uh, uh, one nice thing about having an electronic lab notebook is it allows you to sort of add new content. So for example, this is an image of a mouse mouse brain atlas, and so when the experimentalist is sort of recording from a particular neuron in the brain slice, they can just say, oh, hey, my neuron is about here on the atlas. And then we can sort of aggregate across these, and then we can you know, like do cool analyses across neurons, across atle atlases. Um, OK, right. And, then, and so you know, to, to make the metadata app work, we have to synchronize that with our electrophysiology data acquisition uh, tools. We just have like, APIs that allow them to communicate with each other. Um, but the end result is that each trace of data that's collected, so each sort of voltage trace of the neuron, each spike, is registered to a bit of unique metadata. And so we can sort of go back and forth between them, which is great. Uh, oh, cool. Um, oh, right. So, so, so I mean, like, like uh, so, so, so now, like, we have, like, we're really interested in ways of visualizing this data. Um, right now, we have just, like, a simple listing of experiments, like, basically, like, what you'd see in a lab notebook page, and just, like, a, like a, a web-based way of viewing, like, the actual data that's collected. Um, down the line, like we want to sort of use the metadata that we're collecting via the tablet app to sort of sort the experiments in smart ways, like sort them by who did the experiment or like what was the animal strain used. And ultimately, we'd like to sort of, you know, like do enable in browser analyses. And we're really interested in like sort of tracking provenance of uh, tracking provenance of data. So like if you have a voltage trace and you're doing some analysis on that, we want to track that back to the original voltage trace. Like that's that's the end goal. Uh, so our next steps are sort of like, we want to use these tools that we're developing, like, so we actually use them in the lab. Like, we, we've used them a few times, but so we're only testing. We want to use them and so use them for enough time that we sort of have enough of a data set that we can ask questions like, you know, like, what are, like, the properties of neurons throughout the brain that we weren't really intending to, to sort of look at, but we can now look at now that it's all, all this data is structured in one place. Um, we want to know, like, how easy it is to exp expose these data sets to other databases, like the INCF data space or NIF. Uh, you know, like, you know, this solution is custom to my lab, but, like, lots of labs do electrophysiology, so, like, perhaps they're adaptable to other people. And uh, I think this is the way to go, but, like, who wants to pay for this? I don't know. Um, so let me just acknowledge by, you know, like, my lab, Carnegie Mellon, and also say that, like, you know, all of Elsevier is not evil. Uh, some of them are, I don't know, uh, well, whatever. But, like, thankfully, they paid for this project. It's really cool. So, like, I, me, as a grad student, didn't have to sort of code up this app or, like, code up this data server. Like, they paid people to do that, which is awesome. So, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. A question back here? Yeah. Not many. Like, 200? What has been the uptake? Do people resist it, embrace it, or? I think, well, it's, it's like there's, it's sort of, it's back and forth, it's different. And so it's, it's different from the standard way of doing things, and it's, it's sort of a different workflow. And then, right now we're striking this balance in our app of like, make sure it's not too time consuming versus, uh, versus like actually capturing the data that we want. So the first time we made the app, it was, it's, you had to sort of click everything, and that was, that was like too much work. Yeah. And so now we're sort of redesigning the app, or like we're, yeah, we're like, to, now we, you're capturing less information, but it may be more likely to be used. Uh, there's a balance. Okay, let's thank Shudir yeah. again. Okay, our next speaker is Fan Meng from University of Michigan, and he'll be talking about Pub Anatomy 3D integrating Medline exploration with the Allen Brain Mouse Atlas. Allen Mouse Brain Atlas. Can we skip to Anita first? We need to work with you. Okay. So Anita, can you come first? Uh, Anita Bendrowski from the University of California, San Diego. 
and she'll be talking about a unified research resource layer and experiences from the NOR, the NIF. So, uh, uh, hi, uh, my name is Dr. Anita Bandrovsky. I work for the Neuroscience Information Framework, and today I want to shift gears a little bit uh, in terms of what everybody's been talking about. They've been talking about a lot of really great projects. And what I want to do is I want to look across a lot of those different projects. Um, certainly, I don't need to tell anyone in this room that we're changing the way that we communicate with each other as a scientific community. We are no longer restricted by what goes on pen and paper. Um, so we are actually uh, creating a lot of web-enabled resources and just like PubMed had to go in and say these are all the great things about, um, that have been published in the uh, biomedical sciences, we're trying to do a similar thing with a catalog of all of the things that PubMed doesn't really cover. Databases, uh, tissue banks, software tools, services, these are all outputs. Uh, intellectual outputs of the scientific community and uh, you can imagine that there are some uh, uh, kinds of differences in the way that we want to catalog these things. Um, so we have a, a resource catalog. It contains a lot of the projects uh, that we heard about today. Um, there are things like image repositories. Uh, we label these things with structured metadata and these are our curators that uh, go in and actually uh, structure these, uh, these things, uh, these uh, Projects, you can, you've already seen some of these. I swear I put these slides um, together before today. So there's the fun, uh, thousand functional connectomes, there's a th thousand uh, genomes, et cetera, 3D bar. We have uh, structured data such as uh, where these things are from. Um, there are a lot of different arrows on this slide, and the only thing I want you to notice here is that a lot of these steps are machine steps, so there are machine processing steps that we, uh, we take in order to extract uh, the fact that these uh, resources do exist out of the web and out of the uh, scientific literature, but there are a lot of human steps involved here too, and those are all the red arrows. Whoops. Uh, those are all the red at some point. Ooh, yeah, that's not working too well. All right, here we go. All right, red arrows. Okay, these are human steps, and uh, these are the steps where curators are actually hard at work trying to assign uh, these various metadata. So can we actually look at some of these relationships between these different resources that we have? And actually, the answer turns out to be yes. So uh, we've done a, a bunch of different types of analyses on who's related to whom and how. Um, and so these human annotations, which really tell us that, for example, here the PDB, this is the protein data bank, is related and spawned a whole lot of extra resources. I'm sorry, this is not one of your fantastic plots. This is straight out of uh, one of those hairballs. But anyway, um, what it does tell you is that at least a lot of resources are related to the PDB uh, via these human annotations. But then there are also a lot of uh, annotations that come in from a text mining pipeline, which uh, extracts out the fact that the protein data bank is mentioned in all these various papers. And so we have different kinds of data about each of these resources uh, once they enter into the <coughs> registry, which I implore you to do uh, with all of your resources uh, if, you, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, I swear it only takes five minutes. All right. so. Um, there is this shared resource registry idea. So uh, we have a big registry, and we're actually asking for other people to use it in different ways. And so what, what a lot of people have been starting to do, including these projects here, uh, like the Gene Ontology, the Monarch Initiative, One Mind for Research, is they've actually used our registry, tagged the resources within it as their resources, added additional fields of metadata, and now we know something additional about what it is that is really exciting about those particular resources. We know, for example, um, how many tools uh, are in common between the 3D VC, this is the three-dimensional uh, virtual cell community, 
um, and the gene ontology tools. So there are some tools that are going to be interesting to both communities, and we can actually know that. Um, some of the text mining steps that we take um, can be represented here in the blue line. So what this is, uh, these are uh, resources added on the red. I know that's not really red. Um, but here are the last time that the resource was updated. So we have a little crawler written, and it extracts out all the dates from the websites um, that we actually look at. And this blue line here represents the plot of the date that we find on the website, which is the last time that something was, a web page was updated, and the number uh, of resources where we find that. And what you notice is we ran uh, at the beginning of 2013, most of the sites, so about half, um, a little more than half, were actually updated within the last year. Uh, but the other half actually were updated somewhere all the way back to the year 2000. So there are some websites that appear to have died. Um, we've actually got an analysis now for um, how many have changed their URL, moved from one university to another. So that's uh, an interesting bit of information. And we have a, an idea in terms of the last five years, how many of these wonderful projects that you've seen here today have just flat out disappeared. So about 3% have disappeared and about 8% change uh, within a year or two uh, where they are. So we assume that these are postdocs that go on to their uh, faculty positions. They take their databases with them. Um, now, any time you would imagine that a paper is published, right? <laughs> it would point to a particular URL. Within a couple of years, that URL is no longer going to work. So papers aren't necessarily very good ways to get back to the information about where some of these nice web resources actually live. OK, so databases can have new data every day. How can our curators possibly keep up with that information? And the answer is we can't. Um, so here are some wonderful Connectome resources, some of them represented in this room. I swear I won't point the laser pointer at you, um, Rembrandt, but I will point it at your, uh, at your lovely database. Now, these are all statements about connectivity. Um, and these are wonderful statements about connectivity. We want to have more of them, but we understand that they will update. Um, and so what we have done, and this is uh, our, our uh, wonderful collaborators at uh, Yale, what they've been able to do is they've been able to write a lot of these files and standardize how those things are written so that we actually grab the data from all of these uh, different databases and then give the curators push button control to start servers, stop servers, uh, deploy cr crawlers and other uh, tools. And so what we've got now uh, in the uh, neuroscience information framework are about 200 data sources that are this deeply crawled uh, constituting about 390 million records, um, about 1.5 million links to direct links to articles uh, are now sitting inside of this data. Um, they are divided by curators into types, so we have all kinds of uh, types of data. There are fMRI images, there are phenotypes, statements about drugs, uh, connectivity, obviously, uh, animals, uh, different models. We've seen a lot of wonderful models. So uh, those are the kinds of data that there are. And because the uniform uh, nature of this, we actually have a uniform <coughs> search that is executed across all of the data sets that we have uh, deeply registered. And here I'm searching for a particular structure, subthalamus. <coughs> Our system recognizes that the subthalamus actually has all of these uh, 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 synonyms. So uh, you can read them off on usually the right-hand side. There's the data types are listed on the left. You can take a look at any search and look at what kind of data come back. And then the databases are listed in the middle. You can click into each one of those and actually find the information. So the subthalamus actually turns out to have a lot of connectivity data and a lot of genetic data. You can always uh, put, click on these little uh, uh, bar icons here to get the a category graph or heat maps. I'll show you one of those in a second. Um, so this is what's called a heat map. So you actually need a, uh, an, uh, to register as a user for that, but that's just giving us your email address. Uh, and then you can run this for any term. And here I've run brain. 
Um, and what we do is we basically have uh, the number of data records per data source, which is across the top. And in this case, the brain region. So this is a, a, an ontology that's relatively complete. Um, Dr. Shepard is in the back there. And um, he and others have listed out all of the possible brain regions that you could possibly uh, have. One minute, okay. So um, what I wanted to do uh, very quickly is to not make you stand up and sit down because I don't have enough time, but I wanted to um, ask you all to kind of identify this particular entity. This is the homunculus, very good. All right, so we've got the, the homunculus. I'm not going to describe this because you already know what it is, but I want you to um, understand that we actually have a data homunculus and we can get at what this data homunculus looks like. The data homunculus uh, looks kind of like this. So we have, uh, because we have these wonderful, cool things uh, like a search across 200 databases, we can actually figure out what is the most popular brain region and what is the least popular brain region. So you notice that the, whoops, that the, um, uh, 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 Simpson's uh, comic book guy and uh, the superior cerebellar peduncle of the midbrain actually happen to be quite unpopular. Um, all right, so we can do a lot of other things in terms of checking popularity, seeing where we actually have a lot of data and where we don't have a lot of data. Um, I'll try to finish up quickly here, but I just want to uh, implore all of you to look at the mid midbrain because the midbrain is a very sad structure right now in terms of how much data we have for midbrain, it's sort of like potpourri. We're not really sure what it does, apparently. Uh, we're not sure why we have it. So is it uh, purely decorative? I don't know. Um, but someone should probably look at that because it's there, potentially for some reason. Um, but apparently we have absolutely no data um, to, uh, to tell us why. Okay, so this very quickly is just, we can actually see the different databases and how many brain regions um, they actually cover. So uh, I think that, uh, I'm not sure if uh, Mihai is in the audience, but he wins. He's got over 90% of the brain regions in BAMS. Um, and then uh, you can take a look at this um, as you like. I will, um, I will have it available. So uh, what I wanted to just kind of end with is um, to answer all of your questions about why don't you have my database of commercial, uh, commercial nucleus vagus nerve images in my, you know, in the NIF database. And um, the answer is please recommend a resource if you have that. Uh, I would love to, to get it. Um, um, if you would like to talk to me, uh, there's the, uh, there is my email address. Uh, you can also email uh, info at new info. Also get a hold of me. Uh, I'm theoretically at this poster uh, earlier today. <laughs> and uh, uh, I'll be over at the demo session if that's going on tomorrow. Uh, you can also uh, click on the feedback button. Always a, a good idea. Uh, let us know what you have that we don't have that we don't know about. All right, thank you very much. A quick question. Everyone seems to know so much about the NIA. Already. Okay, for the sake of time, I think we'll move on. Let's thank Cindy one more time. Can you lower the resolution a little bit? I think your resolution is lower. Okay, so now we'll try again uh, with Fang Meng from the University of Michigan. Is it going to work? Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Gary Young. I'm not a uh, Dr. Fan. So, uh, Dr. Fan is uh, on vacation. I'm an intermediate programmer from uh, Molecular and Behavior Neuroscience Institution, uh, which is a part of the University of Michigan. I will, I will introduce your paper, Anatomy 3D. Uh, into integrating Madeline exploration with the Allen Moss Brain Atlas. I will make this very quick. Uh, so this, uh, there's a time 
limited. So if you have any questions, you can just uh, stop me and ask. And this is the outline, and we'll uh, go over all this uh, as quick as possible. Yeah. So why uh, Pabernet Me 3D? So the data from Allen Institution for, for brain science gives a uh, huge opportunity for learning the functional implication of genes in brain. But uh, uh, many mo molecular biologists, they don't know uh, brain structures or uh, the functions very well. So linking uh, other institutions' uh, gene expression data to Mandelin literature will facilitate the integrated exploration of data and the literature related to genes. So uh, the essential function of Public Anatomy uh, 3D is to let the user search Madeline literature and then uh, visualize brain structures and gene expressions from the search results. So there are two types of modules, uh, the search part and the visualization part. The search part has three modules, the, the, the query builder, <coughs> Uh, the query builder, the results, and the results summary. And uh, oh, I see. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, okay, this is the query builder. The query builder is where pe people, uh, the user, input Mandelin search terms in. In here, user can search on a lot of fields. Uh, you can see uh, here. And also, user can search uh, nested uh, search terms with and, or, or not. So there's no limit. Uh, there will be, uh, there can be a lot of levels. Uh, user can drag and drop terms in, uh, to copy or cut. So all these terms, user <coughs> can actually drag, drag and drop. I will, I will show it a little. And uh, then the result. The result is a big dead grid. And it, it lists all the search results. Uh, it uh, has a lot of columns here, you can see. And uh, uh, the PMID column will link user to full text literature. Uh, the result summary. The result summary will scan uh, all the results records and the list of how many times each term is found in uh, on the on each term on each field. So it's like a top end list of the selected selected fields, and the user can also filter filter the list with the prefix. User can uh, uh, the, uh, the can drag uh, one of these uh, the 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 term back to the query builder to refine searching. And uh, among these fields, genes and uh, brain structures can be imported into visualization uh, modules. User can just drag one of these genes into uh, visualization modules. It's all about drag and drop. Uh, we will see. And uh, here's the visualization modules. The three one uh, we have tree grid and 3D stage and the section view and uh, the tree grid well this is the a snapshot the tree grid uh, is this grid at least uh, at least most brain structures it has a tree column for parent and uh, children relations and uh, what the brain structures are listed listed is determined by uh, what type view the tree grid is in. So uh, this one is uh, all structures, all the brain structures is uh, more than 860 brain structures listed here. There is only one instance of this tree grid here. And uh, this is the three, 3D view. And the 3D view uh, only lists on the uh, structures on 3D, 3D stage. And uh, this is the section view, will, uh, which will 
dynamically uh, created by user, and uh, the section views trigger the list structures found from this section view. And uh, here is uh, the triggered with uh, uh, gene columns. So user drag a, a gene from the search result summary into any tree grid, and uh, the gene will become uh, a column. And uh, all the tree grids, uh, they always uh, sort from left to right. So this gene is on the left, so they were sort by this gene. And you can see it. So the gene expression level, the highest is on the top. <coughs> Also, user also can drag the gene from here back to uh, the query builder. Okay, then this is the 3D stage. 3D stage, uh, while well, user drag the gene expression, uh, drag gene into the tree grid, there is the column, and the user can select uh, whatever uh, brain structures they are interested in and show uh, the gene expressions in here. You can see the the, the yellow dot. It's the gene expression, and the size is uh, the expression level. <sighs> mm, right. Okay. And this is the section view. You can see uh, there is uh, the <coughs> ISH uh, image at the, at the background, and in the front, it's the structure structural annotations from other institution. And, uh, well, uh, Papa Anatomy 3D uh, support multiple uh, section view, so user can compare uh, between these views. So that's, uh, that's uh, all the uh, presentation. Uh, I'm going to jump to the uh, live presentation very quickly. So, okay. So let's just search anything. So, you know, whatever you search, you will get... Uh, no? Okay. Very crowded. So any, yeah, right. Uh, you type here, and they will give you a lot of uh, uh, suggestions. How to, uh, there will be a lot of terms you can use. Let's, just, uh, let's use uh, brain first. <coughs> and uh, like uh, there's more than a million results. Then we can go to the summary. The summary. Oh, it's uh, too small. And uh, there's a lot of, uh, this here is the gene symbols uh, summary. There's a lot, but it's just not big enough to show. Uh, and uh, there's the disease. There's a lot of disease here. So, uh, let me just close this one first. And it can be bigger. Okay, let's uh, try some thing. Uh, okay, it's filtered by the prefix, and we go. Uh, we can put this back to the uh, query builder, and this is a quick shortcut. And uh, click filter, and this will re, uh, refine the search, and uh, I get back to the, the gene symbols. And, that's, uh, uh, and this one, this gene. Uh, has 60 uh, counts, so it's, uh, it might be interested. Let me just drag it back into uh, the all brain structures. And then close this one, so. Yeah, one minute, okay. <coughs> and you can see it's, uh, it becomes a, a color. And, uh, well, uh, let me find the, Uh, okay, yeah. Over here and uh, 
find the most interesting uh, thing design here. I'm hungry too. Yeah. Uh, open the 3D structures view. And, uh, oh, we need the, the, gene, uh, the gene too. So open the all structures <coughs> and uh, drag the gene column into the 3D uh, stage. And we have it here. And we can just you know, un enable the, uh, the 3D. Says too small, too small. Let me uh, close this one. And you can see this one. It's just a little too small to to to, to see the real thing. Okay. So let me uh, make the horizontal open this one. And uh, control A, and uh, well, make all the models invisible. And there is the the expression. And uh, so uh, make this one a little uh, visible, and uh, make it. Uh, so this, uh, you can see the expression levels in here, but uh, also let me uh, show you some interesting uh, thing. And uh, we will use this one. Yeah. So this is, this is so far we can get. Uh, and, uh, well, there's uh, a lot of functions in this application, and if you go to this URL, you can actually play with it right now. So it's uh, out of time. That's, that's all.